Hello, everybody. My name's Tim Perko, and you're listening to I Believe. Now what? Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope everyone is enjoying themselves out there. I hope y'all are having a wonderful day. And yes, if you are brand new to this podcast and you are just jumping in, this show is called I Believe Now What. We are a podcast that is geared towards educating and growing the body of Christ and grace and knowledge and just lifting up the church. We go over topical studies. We go over Bible studies. We go over verse studies, word studies. And we'll even do certain topics such as, as we're doing now, like the Reformation, uh, which leads us into this third episode in a four-part series on an introduction to the Reformation and Protestantism really over as a whole. Now, first episode, we went over the background, the foundation that was laid for the Reformation. The second episode, we went over the five solas and how important they were to the Reformation. And today, we are going to go over two individuals that were very key inside the Reformation, uh, the actual Reformation itself. And I know there are so many more individuals, but we would be here forever if we went over every single one. But I'm going to pay attention to two very key and integral people in that uh, Reformation movement, and that is, of course, one, Martin Luther, the one who really sparked off and, and, and took off with this Reformation, and then John Calvin, who expanded and expounded on it not too long after Luther. And we're going to go over those two people and really kind of deep dive into him. Now, a bunch of this is really going to be about Martin Luther. He's going to take up a big chunk. And then John Calvin, we're going to do second towards the end. Uh, Not as much, not as deep into him, but we really want to go strong on those two. And once again, specific emphasis on Martin Luther himself. Once again, too, most of this information that I compiled was from sermons and studies on my own, documentaries that I've watched, uh, gathered information from the Westminster Seminary, from uh, from the Master Seminary, and a large chunk, which really I owe this website a lot because I gathered a lot of my information there because it was already order, organized in such a nice manner, and I highly suggest you to go for it. Um, using a lot of their, their uh, website, <laughs> I guess you would say, as a uh, solid reference because they just outlined it so well and so perfect, and that was Protestantism protestantism.uk.org. Uh, great website. Go check it out. Um, I'm not claiming that all of this stuff is my own and my own doing. I am mostly getting my information from that website uh, and using that as sort of a pseudo script, but more so expounding on what they are saying and explaining it in much simpler terms because sometimes they can use some very big beefy terms that uh, can you got to stop and look up and whatnot. All right, so that leads us into the first person we're going to examine from the Reformation, and that is Martin Luther himself. Martin Luther was born on 10 November 1483 in a Saxon mining town of Esleben, Germany. And hopefully I don't pronounce any of these names wrong because German, sadly, is not a second language to me. But yes, Esleben, Germany. And he was born to the parents of Hans and Marigreth Luther. He was baptized the following day, as was the tradition, uh, the feast day of St. Martin of Tours, and was thus named Martin Luther. Hans Luther was ambitious for his son, and he really wanted to make him pursue a career in law and Martin Luther, for the most part, was in, in very much agreement with it. His, his father wanted him to be educated. He wanted him to be sophisticated, you know, that high society type respectable life, not a blue collar worker, but a person who, you know, is up there in society, respected. He studied law and he knows all this stuff. You know, his father wanted what was he thought was best for him. And once again, like I said, Luther agreed. So that's when Luther entered into the legal uh, faculty of the University of Erfurt in 1501. And that's where he actually received his master's degree there in 1505. But on 2 July 1505, a dramatic change happened. And Luther was caught in a really violent thunderstorm from what the accounts say. And... He 
honestly was afraid of being struck by a bolt of lightning. Lightning was crashing down everywhere. And after one uh, bolt of lightning, Luther cried out for help to St. Anne, the patron saint of minors, saying, I will become a monk if you just let me live. And I'm paraphrasing there. but uh, And obviously, Luther lived through that. And a few weeks later, he made good on that promise. And he entered into the Augustinian monastery at Erfurt. And that decision was not going over very well with his father. I'll just say that. But moving on, Luther embraced his, his, his monastery life with long hours of study and prayer and fasting. Because when he made good on his promise, he made good on his promise. He took that uh, his vows, the vows that all the monks take, in 1506, and he was ordained as a priest in 1507. At this time, Luther was also studying theology at the University of Wittenberg, in Germany, and in 1512, he actually received his doctorate. He then went on to go lecture on several biblical books, including Psalms and Paul's letter to Romans. Luther had a zeal for the study of the Bible. He loved to dig down deep and just study the Bible. And that was really influenced by the humanist movement that we kind of talked about in the first podcast of that day. And it called for the return to the source of the classical Greek and Latin literature. Thus began, Luther began to see how this might be applied in a biblical capacity, not just Greek literature and all this other stuff, but in a biblical capacity, the actual study of the Bible deep back to the basics. They needed to examine the scriptures from the original Hebrew and the Greek text to discover the true meaning of the Bible, rather than the language that it was printed in, which was in Latin. And despite all that hard work and effort, Luther struggled with the weight of his own sinfulness as he as he was reading this. He was just not only disgusted by his sins, but he was so in just a horrible state over his own sinfulness. He read the Bible. He recognized that it pointed out how sinful he was. He put, he, the, Martin Luther said this on the topic. He said, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love. Yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. He would read the Bible. He saw the truth of the Bible. And he was offended by that. As many Christians, uh, before they were actually converted over, were the word offended. But that offense will either make you, as the Bible says, it'll be a stumbling block. Or, if God so ordains it, you know, you will be lifted up out of that and come to understand. But however, at some point in 1515 through 1518, there came a spiritual breakthrough. And Martin Luther was studying the book of Romans, specifically Romans 117. Luther was led to the conclusion that our standing before God depended on our faith alone, not through any works or any goodness within us. And this was called Martin Luther's Tower Experience. Just for reference, Romans 117 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now you have to remember, Luther at this point, like we said, was so tore up, so disgusted with his sins, he would do everything he possibly could. I even heard in one account where it said he kept going to the priest, confessing sins, confessing sins, confessing sins. And the priest was like, okay, you know what? You can only come in so often. You, you're, you're confessing way too many sins. You're coming in way too often because he was so unsure if he was actually saved or not. He was unsure if he was saved. He, he felt so guilty about all of his sins. He didn't know what to do. And upon studying his 
his Bible diligently, that's when he came across that the just shall live by faith. And it all started clicking. Luther explained his discovery in, in quotes there because uh, it was always in the Bible. So it's not really a discovery, but he, his personal discovery in this way. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I have gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteousness lives, but a gift of God, namely by faith. And here I felt I was altogether born again and had entered into paradise itself through the open gates. And that is Martin Luther commenting on when he realized what Romans 1.17 was talking about, specifically to him. The church of the day was very much concerned in this time. And we went in over it the first episode, but the doctrine of indulgences. And that was, as we explained the reducing of the, the the temporary penalty for sin, whether in this life now or when you go to purgatory to burn off those sins, which I say purgatory is not a real place. Purgatory is not a thing. Um, but essentially, just recapping, if you purchased one of these indulgences, then that could reduce the amount of time that you had to spend in purgatory. And it wasn't just for yourself. You can purchase them for loved ones who have already passed. I mean, that was a key selling point to them. Oh, you know, save, save the people who, who your loved ones, your family who are burning in purgatory. Oh, grandma's burning in purgatory right now for the sins that she didn't confess. And if you take this piece of paper right here and buy it from me uh, with, you know, the Pope's blessing is on it, then you, your family will be saved from purgatory. We'll reduce the time or you can altogether just buy them out of purgatory. God will honor it, which obviously there's no biblical context whatsoever. Uh, it, it was horrible because once again, you got to remember people were in the dark at this time. They couldn't read the Bible. They had to list, go sit in the mass and listen to the priest explain. They didn't even explain in their own language. They, they conducted the mass in Latin. They didn't even know what was being said. It was just show up, attend, confess your sins, do the sacraments. That's good enough. You don't need to know what the Bible says. The priest is doing everything for you. It was a totally horrible, horrible uh, system. It was horrible. But back on the indulgences, the Pope, by virtue of his position as God's representative on earth, once again, there's my mocking voice, uh, but he was seen as having the power to grant an indulgence, to grant this relief from the sins that you would have to pay for in purgatory. And this system was abused, abused horribly by the people who peddled this out, most notably by a man named Johann Tetzel. He was a monk who was charged by the Pope to sell these indulgences in Germany. Obviously, he was German. Look at that name, Johann Tetzel. (laughs) But the money that was raised were, amongst other things, being used really to fund the rebuilding of St. Peter's Church in Rome. I mean, this is horrible. This is horrible. I went over a little bit in the first episode, but they were essentially selling this so they can just keep building the Vatican up and a lot of it to St. Peter's Church in Rome. Johann Tetzel wrote this, this, this little phrase that he would say as he would go around. He'd say, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Oh, catchy little salesman cue right there. Once again, just deceiving these poor people who had no idea because they couldn't read the Bible. It was in Latin. They didn't understand what the priest said because it was in Latin. They were in the dark and they just put their full trust in the church. And if they said that this man, the Pope, can relieve family members from the horribleness of purgatory and whatever that is, you can't figure it out in the Bible because it's not in there. Uh, They believed it. They believed it because they were in the dark. And this is what really set Luther off. Luther saw this corruption happening around him and he felt forced. 
to move into action. Now, what happens next is honestly an issue of debate, but the traditional account is that on October 31st, 1517, Reformation Day, as we know it now, Luther posted up a series of 95 discussion points known as the 95 Theses on the door of the castle of the Church of Wittenberg. To present these discussion points in this way was an accepted practice at the time. So it wasn't so like as revolutionary as we uh, envision it, you know. Uh, This was acceptable during that time. But Luther did not and honestly could not anticipate the reaction that this would have. Now, mind you, something very, very big was going on in this time outside of the church, an invention. And that invention was called the printing press. The printing press just revolutionized the way that you can pass around literature because no longer did a scribe have to sit there and and write out every single thing on a hundred different flyers that they were going to pass out. Now, you just got to Use the printing press, use the blocks that they have, go ahead, pull the machine down, bam, it's printed. And you could just keep making copies and copies and copies and copies as long as you didn't run out of ink and paper. It was a then modern copy machine to them. And this revolutionized and really was the result of how the 95 Theses got out. They were printed and they were circulated all around Germany. We're not sure how they got their hands on them, but I'm eventually, I'm assuming that a passerby saw that grabbed it and was like, oh my gosh, this makes sense. <laughs> you know, So it got passed out and printed all over the place. And soon it reached other parts of Europe too, not just in Germany. And at this point, Pope Leo X took notice of the developments and Luther was summoned to appear before him in 1518. After a change of heart, the Pope instead sent Cardinal Thomas to meet with Luther and demanded that he recant his views. Now, mind you, remember what I told you about the Catholic Church. If you were not with them, you were against them. And if you were against them, you were burned at the stake. That's how they killed people. You were burned alive at the stake. Now, Luther refused to recant his views. And in a public debate in in a town that I do not know how to pronounce in 1519, Uh, He stated publicly that he could no longer accept the palpal supremacy. Oh my gosh. The shockwaves that that must have sent through. Pope Leo X then issued a declaration known as Bull in June 1520 and demanded that Luther retract 41 of his 95 theses to avoid the possible threat of excommunication from the church and really execution by the church. Luther decided to publicly burn the bull in December 1520. Luther, as you're going to find out as we're going through it, Luther was a very brash person. He was a very bull-headed person. He was probably somebody that you would look at and be like, this is like one cocky dude. Um... Hopefully that word doesn't offend anybody. I don't mean it in a nasty way. But they would, you would say that. You know, this is one full of himself kind of guy. He was very bull, very brash. So he burned the bull, like I said, in December 1520. And it was then issued with another bull in January 1521, bringing the excommunication into full force. Now, in August 1520, Luther published his work to the Christian nobility of the German nation. That's what it was called, which talked about and outlined his plans to reform the church in Germany. So once again, I've said this, I think I said it in the last episode, Luther was never out to separate from the Catholic church. He wanted to reform the church. He wanted to change the church from the inside. He wanted them to see that, look, what we're doing, this isn't in the Bible. This is not biblical. He didn't want to take, make us his own church. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church from the inside. So he gave an expulsion of his theology with a particular emphasis on the sacraments, mind you, in the prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the church and in the freedom of a Christian. 
he explained his emphasis on salvation through faith in Christ. Now, having originally allowed penance, Luther eventually settled on only two sacraments, baptism and communion. There were a multitude of other penances, or not penances, sorry, uh, sacraments that uh, the Catholic Church requires that you do in order to achieve salvation. I don't know if they say that now, it changes so much, but at least then it was. You know, you had to participate in these sacraments. And they were really, a lot of them was just invented by men. Luther only settled on two of them, saying these are legit, baptism and communion. Now, we're not going to really get into the discussion of, you know, do you have to be baptized, you know, water baptism in order to be saved? And do you have to participate in communion to be saved? I I, I personally do not believe so. But we're, once again, we're not getting into that specific stuff. This is about Martin Luther and what Martin Luther actually believed. So by now, Luther's language had become more and more strident. And he honestly just became more and more emboldened in denouncing the authority of the Roman Catholic Church including his frequent references to the Pope as the Antichrist. I mean, he totally flipped the script. It, it, it's, it's quite amazing how this all went down and how Luther was managing to stay alive throughout this time. Now, in January 1521, the Emperor Charles V summoned Luther to appear at the Diet of Worms, or the Diet of Worms is an assembly. Uh, it was an assembly in Worms, Germany, and he was actually granted safe conduct there by Frederick de Guise, Prince of Saxony, arriving there in April 1521. Luther was given one more chance to recant. Now, why did he need safe passage? Because like I said, he made an enemy of the church. The church wanted to kill him. There were probably people out there who loved the Catholic church, the Roman Catholic church, and wanted to kill him. But Prince Frederick de Guise uh, you know, went ahead and said, hey, check this out. Or Emperor Charles, or, jeez, I'm so sorry. Prince Frederick the Wise, I'm mixing up all these names here, granted him that pace, that safe passage so that way he wouldn't get killed because he needed it. Okay, Tim, you're like reiterating the same thing over and over again. I know, that's just how my brain works sometimes. But however, when Luther was given that one last chance to recant, he said this, Unless I am convicted by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And some people quote it as neither safe nor sane. Uh, regardless of the fact, this was a huge statement. And with these words, the breach within the Roman Catholic Church became permanent. An edict was then issued declaring that Luther was a heretic, meaning, oh, you, we want you dead. And his writings were banned. Remind, remember, the Catholic Church, not the same church of today. It had power, it had influence, and if they said this, my gosh, it was probably going to happen. So Luther fled before the diet ended and decided to go ahead and hide in the Wartenberg Castle in, in um, this German town that I really don't know how to pronounce, and I'm very sorry. Eisenach, I hope that's correct. <laughs> like I said, I am not a seven-year seminary student, but that is... Uh, Beyond the point. Moving on. He actually spent a year there at that castle, and he was working actually on a translation of the Bible into German, another taboo that the Catholic Church did not want because, God forbid, people can actually read their Bibles. Anyways, moving on. Uh, in 1522, Luther returned to Wittenberg, where he carried out several reforms, and he was assisted by his colleague, uh, once again, I'm going to chop and screw his name up, but Philip Melanchthon, and uh, who was 
born in 1497, died in 1560, and that man actually wrote a presentation of Protestant theology known as the loci communes or the common places. Now, Luther, Luther's posting of the 95 Theses propelled this man into the spotlight, dispelled him into the spotlight in a way that even Martin Luther himself could not have thought of or imagined. Printed as opposed to verbal ideas could travel so much faster. And we talked about this with the invention of the printing press and how just it revolutionized how you can pass around information. It was like, you know, the discovery of the Internet. It was huge. Luther's had a really, as I said before, strong personality, very brash, and coupled that with the fact that he had tapped into underlying nationalism in Germany against the palpal uh, inferences made for a powerful stimulus for reform. I mean, he was revolutionizing everything. People were responding to this. The gospel was coming out of the darkness. Once ref this reform had started, the course it was going to take was less inevitable, though. To many, the Pope had been slow to respond. Very slow to respond. Firstly, to the demands for reform. And secondly, once the Reformation had begun to provide a robust response, the, the, they were either they were just completely unconcerned, they didn't think it was going to catch on, or they did not know how to respond, which I go to that. The Catholic Church did not respond to the Reformation with its own counter-Reformation. Or I'm sorry, the Catholic Church did respond to the Reformation with its own counter-Reformation. And that started at the Council of Trent. That went on from 1545 to 1563, which firmly rejected many of the emerging doctrines of the Reformers, but did not address some of their complaints. Although Luther had initiated the Reformation, he could not control it. And what exactly it meant to be Reformed and what the Reformation was, he, as I said before, he could not control it. He did not, he, he didn't, once the fire was lit, it started spreading. He lit the fire. And obviously the kindling and everything was laid down by the people we talked about in the first episode. But he's the one who went over there, lit the fire, and that fire spread. And he could not control it anymore. And as I said before a few other times, Luther, and I want to make this clear, did not want to leave and separate from the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. Yet, if reform was being resisted or delayed, separation was going to be inevitable. And as he argued that the Reformation would restore the church to the biblically correct doctrine of salvation, not break off into your own sex, he wanted the church to be reformed. He wanted one church, one universal Catholic church. That's what Catholic church means, universal. He didn't want all these separate denominations and all this stuff. That was him. Whether or not denominations are a good thing, we're going to get into that when we get into the denominations episode. Now, something else that big was going around at this time was the Renaissance. And the Renaissance had all these new ideas and models of learning. And they were a large part. They played a large part in the demands for reform, reform in the church. And honestly, a growing sense of individualism against clericalism or it's, you know, the person, the people versus the church. Uh, and the right for any individual to read and understand scriptures for themselves against the control of the church was again a very powerful force. People wanted to read the Bible. They wanted to interpret scripture for themselves, which is the way it's supposed to be, as opposed to having the church tell them what scripture says. Luther said this on the topic. He said, a simple layman armed with scripture. A layman is, by the way, uh, an uneducated preacher. So somebody like, kind of like myself, really, uh, who's not school educated, but instead reads the Bible, does their own extracurricular study, uh, listens to classes, all this stuff, but doesn't have a formal certificate of training. I guess that's the way you can put it. And there's many good, great preachers out there who are laymen. Uh, but he said a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Once again, another big statement. German peasantry at this time launched a full scale revolt against the nobility in 1524, hoping to gain support from Luther. However, Luther chose actually not to support them, partly because of the brutality of the revolt and also because he relied on the support and protection of the nobility. So it's kind of a double, 
double entendre there. In fact, Luther lost credibility in advocating a ruthless suppression to the end of the uprising. He didn't want to see the war, and also a lot of his the nobles were his buddies and kept him safe. But in 1525, Luther married his wife, Catherine von Bora. She was a former nun, and his decision to do so set a seal of approval on clerical marriage. And mind you, that is a big deal. Even today, priests do not get married. Uh, But there is nothing in the Bible that says a pastor, a priest, or whatever should not be married. Apostle Paul wrote about it. He said, I wish some of you weren't married so you can go out and do this and do that. But marriage is essential. I mean, look at today with the especially a few years ago with all those scandals that were going on with the Catholic Church, uh, the pedophilia and all that stuff that was happening. Is be- and I'm not going to blame the uh, cause on this, but it plays a role in it. Uh, you know, you have these men who are suppressing these sexual desires uh, that God allowed us to express through a biblical marriage, but they're suppressing it because they believe they can't be married, and then they end up doing something horrible like taking it out on a young child, which is disgusting and wrong and horrible. Once again, I'm not blaming that suppression as the cause. The person and the sin is the cause. Um, But you see these factors that feed into it. But moving on, that marriage that Martin Luther had actually resulted in six children. Luther wrote this about his wife. He said, My Katie is in all things so obliging and pleasing to me that I would not exchange my poverty for the riches of Croesus. And I hope I said that last part right, because like I said, I don't speak German. (laughs) But in 1529, Luther met with a Swiss reformer, and his name was Ulrich Zwingili, at Marsburg, in order to attempt an agreement on theological matters and thus unifying Protestant theology. Now, uh, Of the 15 points that were presented, all were agreed except for one, which was the doctrine of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And this is still a highly debated topic. In other words, it was what we talked about, transubstantiation. Um, One, the Catholic Church believes that the priest has the power to turn that bread and wine into the literal flesh and blood of Christ. And when you partake in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper or communion, that's what you're doing. You're literally eating his body and you're literally drinking his blood. Um, The Protestant side, for the most part, believes that that is not true. That it is a symbolic representation. And we do this in remembrance of Christ rather than the literal eating and drinking of Christ's flesh and blood. Luther himself argued that the real bodily presence of of Christ was in there. He believed in that. He believed in transubstantiation. But Zwingeli, he disagreed, arguing that the bread and the wine were only symbols of Christ's body and blood. The year 1530 now saw the publication of the Augsburg Confession, and it was a statement of Lutheran doctrine. This confession was mostly edited by... Uh, Philip, and I messed his name up before, I'm going to mess it again, Philip Melikaton. Apart from his theological writings, Luther wrote several, and this is where it gets kind of sad towards the end of his life, several anti-Semitic works, uh, that is anti-Jewish, Jewish hate works, which have stimulated a lot of discussion among historians. Now, modern Lutherans have rejected those views that he wrote about. Pretty much, he was making fun of Jews. He had a hate for the Jews, almost, that you can say. I don't know if hate's the right word, but he did not like the Jews. Almost like he's blaming them for killing Christ. But we know that was according to God's plan, and God still has, according to the Bible, a place for Israel. Not a separate theology. They're still saved the same way we are, but God still has a place for Israel. God still has a plan for Israel. Luther rejected that. But as I was saying, modern Lutherans do not accept that. They they disregard those later writings of Luther. Uh, just because, honestly, a modern ear, to a modern ear, it sounds very harsh and unforgiving. And um, who knows why it was in there. I mean, 
you can't get everything right. Am I right? <laughs> so Sal, while suffering with uh, some ill health for many years, Luther eventually did die on, of course he did say that like it's a weird statement, but he did die on 18 February uh, 1546. And he was at, at Esleben and was buried in Wittenberg. And his last words included a striking statement written in both German and Latin. He said, we are beggars. This is true. And that's where we're going to go ahead and leave off with Martin Luther and move into our next uh, person. And don't worry uh, that this portion is not going to be nearly as long as we talked about Luther. But we're going to talk about John Calvin. John Calvin was born, and I don't speak French, so I'm probably going to chop and screw a lot of these names up too. But John Cor... uh, Oh my gosh. John Calvin was born as Jean Chavon in Nyon, France. And Nyon, in the French region of Picardy, lies about 65 miles northeast of Paris. Now Calvin, and that is the anglicized version of his name, or the, you know, more uh, English version of his name, entered into the University of Paris in 1523 to study law. And he actually received his doctorate there in 1532. While he was in Paris, he actually studied the writings of Martin Luther and became convinced of the need for reform. See what I talked about? That fire that sparked and the flames started spreading? Calvin grabbed a hold of that. But sadly, opposition led him to seek refuge elsewhere because of his ideas. And in 1536, en route to Basile, he stayed in Geneva. And this is where he met a man named William, William Farrell. We kind of talked about him. From, he lived from 1489 to 1565. And William Farrell was the man who actually persuaded John Calvin into remaining there and really keen the Reformation up in that area. Now, in 1536, Calvin actually published in Latin the first edition of his magnum opus on Christian theology or the Institutes of Christian Religion with the final edition being published in 1559. These institutes were later translated into French, English, and several other languages. And from the basis for, it, it really, it, it formed the basis for his Calvinist theology to this day. Now, Calvin did not coin Calvinism and whatever, but the, his supporters, his followers, gathered this and called it Calvinism, just based off of what he wrote. Now, with the aid of William Farrell, Calvin sought to change the political and spiritual life of the city. A confession of faith was drawn up, and to which all Genevans in Geneva, that's what they called them, Genevans, they were expected to adhere to it. And Calvin also sought powers of excommunication kind of like the Pope, uh-oh, which led to a lot of resistance. Now, as a result, Calvin fled to Strasbourg, where he led a church there. And he also decided to marry in 1539. Then in 1541, Calvin returned to Geneva. He decided to create a theocracy, or a city of God, basing it on the Old Testament model. So the government of Geneva was placed in the hands of pastors, elders, and deacons, and he also set up uh, the consistory or a church court to enforce discipline. Enforcement could be really harsh with floggings and other punishments that were used. You know, it's experimental society. But most notable was the case of Michael uh, Servetus. Now, this was the I can get really, really deep into this, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and be brief with it. This man was imprisoned by the Roman Catholic authorities on charges of heresy. Servetus had denied the Trinity, and he also denied the true divinity of Christ. But Servetus escaped uh, to Geneva, but he was arrested there and burned at the stake. And Calvin was the one who actually personally approved of this burning. Very controversial because it was almost like a repeat of what was going on in the Catholic Church. Perhaps the most important aspect, though, of Calvin's theology was in his analysis of the doctrine of predestination. And this is one that a lot of Christians debate over time and time again. If you know me, if you listen to this show, I am a believer in, using little quotes here, predestination or God's unconditional election uh, because it's in the Bible. 
It's all over the Bible. You, you can't argue that it's not in the Bible. It's all over the Bible. But a lot of people don't agree with it because it takes control out of their hands. Now, this isn't an episode on predestination. I've already done that. If you want to go back and check it out, please do. Uh, but Calvin argued that salvation was something that was not nearly, not fe- freely chosen, but rather individuals were elected to salvation by God. And these individuals, known as the elect, which is in the Bible, uh, are known only to God. John Calvin wrote on this. He said, predestination is the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. Not all are created on equal terms, but some are preordained to eternal life. Others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of these ends, we say that he has been predestined to life or death. Now, obviously, that's a huge statement, and I don't personally call myself a Calvinist because statements like that can be taken very... If somebody identifies a statement like that with you, uh, that says a lot. I personally do believe that God predestines those who will survive when it comes to the predestination of wrath. Oh, you know, that then then they get that, that topic gets, you know, like a double predestination. That topic gets deeper. I more so believe that it's more of a Passover. That God passes over them. And for no other reason besides God is God chose some to believe and some not to believe. And now I don't want to get super deep into this. Uh, Because once again, like I said, I already did an episode on it, and I feel that episode explains everything the exact way that I wanted to explain it then. But this is what Calvin said on it, not what I'm saying on it. This is what Calvin said on predestination, which was his most controversial doctrine. Now, Calvin died on 27 May 1564 at Geneva, and he was buried in a cemetery there. His influence led to the development of Reformed churches, which we're going to get into in our next episode of how we got our denominations, which will lead into our last episode, or our, our new series, which is going to be on denominations. And those Reformed churches typically hold to what is now known as the five points of Calvinism, which he did not create, but his followers created based off of his writings. So that's all we got for today on the reformer side of the things. We went over two very influential people of the reform. And now this is going to bring us uh, to a, to our next episode, which is going to be on the different Protestant denominations and how we got those denominations. So if you're excited for that, please stay tuned. And if you listen to this whole episode, thank you very much. I hope I didn't uh, confuse anybody or anything. I know I added a little bit of my own theology in there towards the end with regards to Calvin. Once again, I don't affirm or deny anything really Calvin said because I haven't done enough studying into it myself on what he actually said on what is called Calvinism today. But uh, I will say that uh, my episodes that I did on it. I actually did one on each five points of Calvinism. That's what I hold my beliefs to. And if you're curious about it, please check those episodes out. But if you have any questions, please, as always, drop it in the Facebook, drop it in the Twitter. I believe now what y'all have a wonderful time and y'all have a great day. And thank you for listening.